Um, my name is Dr. Mari Pouatnin. Uh, I'm a research scientist at the Australian Institute of Marine Science. Um, I'm not a marine biologist. I'm a geographer. So I work with a lot of marine biologists and I help them design their field surveys to make sure we get the maximum value from the data we're able to collect because it's expensive um, taking ships out onto the ocean. Um, and I build spatial predictive models trying to uh, make a very educated guess about what types of living communities are on the sea floor in between the places where we can actually look and my favorite thing to do is uh, to look at how coral reefs are impacted both positively and negatively by tropical cyclones, which can smash them up with giant waves, but also can cool them off when the water gets too hot. And I'm now part of the Reef Restoration and Adaptation Program, which is trying to give coral reefs a helping hand in the face of climate change, which I'll mention towards the end of the talk. Uh, and my role is to make sure we're careful about where we try to help coral reefs to make sure we don't waste money. So, for example, we don't want to spend a million dollars fixing up a reef that's likely to get pounded by cyclones every single year. So that's an intro. Um, today, I'm going to talk to you about corals, their characteristics, and how that helps them provide ecosystem services to humanity and why that's under threat in the face of climate change. So coral reefs, you probably know, are the only living structures that are actually visible from space, uh, like this little piece of the Great Barrier Reef. So they create, they, uh, create immense rocky structures to be able to be visible from space. But uh, if we have a close look, and many of you have probably been scuba diving or snorkeling on a reef, you know that they're just chock-a-block full of a huge diversity of marine life. The corals themselves come in many different species, uh, which manifest in all kinds of different shapes, like plates and uh, brains and branches. Uh, they're like undersea gardens, but even more importantly, uh, they host uh, a wide variety of marine life. They provide habitat for like fish or sea stars, uh, sea urchins, uh, and then mobile things uh, like turtles, manta rays, sea snakes, sharks. So I'm sure you probably already knew all that. Um, coral reefs, so there's a distinction between corals and corals that form actual reefs. So all over the world, shown at the red squares on the map, um, you can find corals. But in deeper, colder waters, they don't form reefs. It's the shallow, tropical, um, and subtropical corals that actually create the big rocky stru structures that we know as coral reefs. And I'm sure you're familiar and maybe you've even been to uh, coral reefs in Western Australia, like Ningaloo Reef up at Coral Bay and Exmouth. And maybe you've even been to the Great Barrier Reef over on Australia's Northeast Coast. And that's where I did my PhD. So I was very lucky. Uh, to get to visit that, but there's coral reefs all around the world as well. So here's some examples of some reefs. This one is one you won't have seen. East Holotheria Reef is about halfway between Cairns, or sorry, Broome and Darwin, not Cairns, that's the other side. <laughs> uh, and hardly anyone's been there, probably a handful of scientists, uh, luckily, including me. Oops. Let me click on the video. So this is uh, this reef at low tide. So you can actually see the rocky structures uh, emerging from the water that form this reef. Um, and we were wandering out around having a look. So this makes it easy to see that many separate 
coral colonies actually combine to form a big reef. And they have many forms like branches, plates. Here's a close up of some coral branches, some brain corals, a foliaceous coral. And as I mentioned before, they provide habitat to things like sea turtles, sea stars, sea urchins, uh, and giant clams. And just another example over here from Scott Reef, you can see a sea cucumber and a sea snake, lots of beautiful tropical fish, a manta ray, a leopard shark, um, some beautiful branching coral and a tiger shark, uh, and some dolphins and seabirds. So as we all already know, coral reefs are magnificent and beautiful and deserve to exist just for that alone but they actually provide massive ecosystem services to humanity. Uh, and this is why we should care about coral reefs, even if we don't already, with a value of almost 10 trillion US dollars around the globe, um, helping 500 million people. So coral reefs obviously support tourism when we're not in the middle of COVID uh, because they're so magnificent to visit. But they also um, are a key habitat for fish that people like to eat. Uh, and a well-managed reef can support five to 10 tons of fish per kilometer squared per year. Uh, they support biodiversity, which underpins uh, the constant discovery of new medicines, which is particularly important in the time of COVID. Uh, and any future pandemics um, we may have. And then also coastal protection, which we'll mention more in a second. Coral reefs uh, play a huge role in protecting the world's coastlines from big waves and erosion. So this picture just shows you why some of these ecosystem services happen. Why do corals provide them? So here's a diagram of what a coral reef looks like underwater. You can see that it has complicated uh, three-dimensional structures. Um, and when waves come along from the open ocean, they have to interact with these structures and that slows them right down and dissipates their energy. In fact, wave heights can go down on average by 84%. Um, and the average reduction or dissipation can be up to 97%. So you can see why that can make a big difference. And that's why kids in North Queensland don't buy boogie boards unless they go on a boat to the outer reef because it's just not wavy because the Great Barrier Reef is there. So this same structural complexity that dissipates waves um, is what you find on healthy reefs with lots of different types of coral and lots of coral cover. And that provides lots of hidey holes um, and habitat for fish so that they can flourish uh, and escape predators. And there can be a lot of diversity of species. And when a reef is degraded um, and damaged, then you lose that structural complexity and it diminishes those ecosystem services. So uh, importantly, um, different types of corals. So corals come in different growth forms, uh, such as these massive or brain corals, branchy corals, foliaceous, free living, plate-like and columnar corals you see here, and even encrusting corals, which basically just grow really close to the surface of the underlying rock. So each of these different types of coral uh, vary in how easy it is to damage them from the key disturbances uh, that affect coral reefs. So for example, and we do this, uh, I do this in schools where I get kids to do a coral reef Lego challenge. So I get them to build branchy corals and massive corals out of Lego. You can try this sometime if you like Lego and you wanna have a bit of fun and avoid your other work. So um, what you'll find if you do that is branching corals are really fast to build. So they grow really fast, but they're really easy to break. And the same thing happens in the real ocean. Waves break them really easy because they stick far up into the water column. They're also the favorite food of predatory crown of thorns starfish. 
And they're the most sensitive to damage when the oceans get too hot. Um, so we think of them as fast to grow, but first to go. Uh, in contrast, massive corals like this brain coral or this one, they're really resistant to waves. It takes a lot more wave energy to damage them. Starfish will eat them, but only after all the other ones are gone. Uh, and they're less sensitive when the water gets hot, but they can be damaged. So what happens is you have a disturbance, let's say a massive cyclone or a big bleaching event. Um, the branching coral will get damaged more, but because it grows back faster, if there's enough time, let's say five to 10 years before the next disturbance, uh, they'll grow back and the reef will be maintained. However, if we start getting disturbances happening so fast, less than 10 years and especially less than five years, then it's upsetting the balance. And these are more structurally complex than these. So you can see you're going to start to lose that structural complexity that is underpinning a lot of those ecosystem services that reefs provide. So unfortunately, threats to coral reefs are becoming more frequently. And I'm sure you've heard of coral bleaching, where healthy color for coral turns bright white and it can die and become overrun by algae. So the key to understanding why coral bleaching happens is to know that coral reefs are actually really weird. They're actually a rock, an animal, and a plant all at the same time. So corals form these huge rocky structures that um, can block uh, waves, as we mentioned. But actually, those rocks have been created by millions to billions to trillions of tiny little animals with tentacles about the size of a fingernail. Um, and they do that. They secrete an external skeleton uh, the minute they settle on a reef because they don't want to get swept away. And all those skeletons merge together to form the colonies that then join together to form the reef. And inside of each of these coral polyps, they have a transparent body, are billions to trillions of microscopic plants. So the corals get 90% of their energy from photosynthesis from these microalgae. Um, even though they can feed with their tentacles, that's often not very successful. And uh, just like green leaves uh, are green because of their photosynthetic pigments, um, corals through their transparent bodies have brilliant colors from the zooxanthellae or the microalgae that live inside them. So it all goes wrong when the water gets too hot for too long. Uh, and this causes the algae to produce free radicals, which are compounds that damage the coral. And this, oops, this video shows this happening in a controlled experiment in an aquarium. So this is a coral polyp and its mouth is in the center here. You see it convulsing and that's because it is spitting out, um, see that cloud? That is uh, millions and millions of tiny zooxanthellae algae that it's spitting out because the algae don't like to be too hot and they're damaging the coral. Now, if you let it go on, um, eventually this coral would look white because you'd be seeing its skeleton through its transparent body. In this case, they stopped the experiment and let it recolonize with zooxanthellae and recover. And indeed, corals can recover if uh, the water cools off in time. But the problem is um, bleached corals can starve to death if they don't recover in time. And this can happen over vast areas at a time. This is 2016 on the Great Barrier Reef, uh, a picture taken from the air. You can see all the white corals. So you can have huge areas being affected at once. And if it starts happening too frequently, uh, so less than 10 years apart, then you're starting to just degrade the reef on a downward trajectory. 
So you might have heard about the Great Barrier Reef um, having mass coral bleaching um, three times from 2016 to 2020. So in 2016, the red is where you had severe bleaching. Then it moved down to the central GBR the next year. And then in 2020, it basically went everywhere else it hadn't been. So that is too close together for full recovery. And there's a whole bunch of papers I could point you to where people are starting to see the consequences of having those three events so close together. So if the average earth temperature compared to what it was before humans started burning fossil fuels gets more than 1.5 degrees above that baseline, uh, it basically threatens the survival of the world's coral reefs as we know them. And this graph from the Intergovernmental Panel on Climate Change shows that. Um, so for warm water corals, these purple colors mean irreversible widespread change. One degree is the change is uh, when we've risen the average earth temperature by one degree from what it was before. Right now we're at about 1.4. So for coral reefs, we're up in this purple. If we get to 1.5, uh, if we get above 1.5, they estimate that 99% of the world's coral reef area will be lost as we know them. Um, and then obviously the other really dramatic impacts we can already see besides reefs are in the Arctic. So I'm sure you're aware that we're in the midst of the climate crisis, so I haven't spent much time on this. Uh, if you haven't seen the climate stripes, check it out at showyourstripes.info. Each line vertically is colored based on how warmer or colder than average it was um, around the world in that particular year. So you can see the dramatic trend from cooler to way, 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 way hotter. And I'm sure you know the reason we're getting hotter is that as we've been burning things like coal, gas, uh, et cetera, uh, we're creating gases that are building up in our atmosphere that are really good at trapping the sun's energy. Um, there's all kinds of sources of them, but the most common one is carbon dioxide. The problem with it is that it takes thousands of years to break down. So over time, it builds up. Um, and more and more heat gets trapped, which is what's happening. And the bulk of that heat is going into the oceans. And so we're getting more and more episodes of hot ocean. So what are scientists actually doing to help? So at Ames, where I work, we're part of a global effort to um, try and help reefs survive until the climate can be stabilized. And one way to do this is to try and breed heat resistant corals. So let the corals evolve, but quicker in the laboratory uh, and uh, try and get them with zooxanthellae, for example, that are more heat resistant. And then you, once you've done that, you can plant them out on the reef. Um, and there's other interventions as well that people are considering. And the, in Australia, there's a program called the Reef Restoration and Adaptation Program or RRAP. I'm part of that and my role is to help make sure that we locate any interventions we decide to do in the best possible place so they have the maximum impact for the money that's spent. But what I wanted to end with is uh, something that I call the Reef Restoration Feasibility Challenge and it was inspired by Terry Hughes when I heard him speak at uh, Climate Reality uh, put on by Al Gore in Brisbane a few years ago. And he just did a back of the envelope calculation of what would it take to actually restore enough corals to make up for um, coral bleaching. Um, and so I'll just take you through uh, a back of the envelope calculation here. So imagine Lizard Island, uh, which is on the Great Barrier Reef, uh, its reefs cover approximately 10 kilometers squared. So if you assume that uh, 200 coral colonies can fit into one meter squared, you can work out how many coral colonies would fit on Lizard Island's reefs. So if you remember that a thousand meters equals one kilometer, 
uh, you work out that two uh, million colonies would fit into Lizard Island's reefs. So then you can look in the literature and find out, uh, oh wait, hang on. So if you assume one third of Lizard Island's colonies were destroyed by bleaching, then you can work out how many you need to transplant. Uh, so that's just dividing by three. And so you get 666,667 colonies. Then if you look in the literature, uh, the last time I checked, uh, the estimate was that it would cost US $150 per colony to grow it and then transplant um, a heat resistant colony onto the reef. So then you can work out, okay, how, how much will it cost to repair Lizard Island from one bleaching event? Um, and that's 100 million US dollars, which is a fair bit. <laughs> So then if you go up a level in spatial scale and you look at the bleaching event that happened on the Great Barrier Reef in 2020, 259 reefs were bleached. So if we make it really easy and we assume they were all the same size as Lizard Island, and again, that one third of the colonies were destroyed, you would need to transplant 172,666,667 colonies. And at $150 each, that would cost 25.9 billion US dollars. So then it's important to remember that actually coral bleaching happens at a global scale. Usually um, uh, there are bleaching events happening all around where reefs exist, uh, so in these red areas. So the world's coral reefs uh, cover an area of 284,300 square kilometers. If we assume that uh, mass bleaching destroyed 1% of this area in a given year, that would be 2,843 square kilometers. And uh, you would need to plant a huge amount of corals. And it would cost $85.29 billion uh, from just one event. And then if you look into the literature a bit more, you realize oops, like, that actually only 54% of transplanted corals survive. So that means you need to do it again to get the full effect. And that would be 124.5 billion dollars. So coral restoration by itself cannot keep pace uh, with the, what we call thermal stress caused by climate change as it's progressing. Um, it has to be paired with drastic and immediate cuts to the greenhouse gases and other, other um, from whatever source that are causing climate change. Uh, luckily, um, there's because it's such a multifaceted problem, it means there's tons and tons of possible ways to make a difference that anyone and everyone can do by reducing your carbon footprint. So for you guys, one easy thing you can do is walk to school, or if you can't walk to school, take public transport instead of by yourself uh, in a car. Uh, beef especially has a huge carbon footprint uh, in terms of transporting it all around the world, uh, feeding the cattle, the, the emissions from their farts, <laughs> all kinds of things. And vegetables have a much lower carbon footprint, so you can add some more veggies. Um, you can be careful with your food scraps. Actually, the methane that's produced by food that you throw in the bin creates huge amount of heating. Um, and another thing that's fun to do that anyone can do is plant a tree. Uh, so these are just examples of ways right now, uh, no matter what anyone else is doing, you can make a difference to try and help save coral reefs. And I think that was what I had. So hopefully I've left enough, plenty of time for questions. Thank you. 
Happy to. How do you plant lab-grown corals on bleached reef? Um, so that's a good question. The, um, what you have to do, obviously, is an assessment of where suitable substrate uh, will be um, to make sure that those corals are going to successfully transplant to that place. So um, you need to assess whether you've got the right species uh, that can go into that particular environment. So one of the things we're working on in the reef restoration and adaptation program right now is um, coral modeling to, um, to characterize across the different reefs, uh, what are the different microhabitats so we know which types of corals can go where. Um, but yes, uh, it's it's not as easy as as it sounds, and then obviously you need to to make sure that the bleaching um, uh, that you you can find a suitable spot amongst the decayed uh, coral skeletons. So you I don't know. I mean, I'm not the one in the field, but you might have to clear away something to make a spot. It's a good point. Um, is it possible to relocate rapid, rapidly growing or resilient corals to damaged reefs, even from a different places around the world? Yeah, so that goes back to the same thing um, that, that I was just saying. You have to be careful that that particular coral that you want to transplant will thrive under the environmental conditions. So for example, on even a single reef, the wave exposure really varies depending on where you are. So at really fine spatial scales. So uh, at, the, at the front of the reef, uh, with regard to where the incoming waves normally come, uh, you have much higher wave energy. So you wouldn't be able to put um, a coral of a fragile branching form, for example, in that really wave swept uh, energy environment because it wouldn't be adapted to that. Um, so a lot of, uh, of careful consideration has to go in and it's tricky because often we don't have that fine scale data everywhere to be able to know. So the real danger is to get out in the field in your inflatable zodiac with your corals, thinking that, yeah, I'm going to plant them here. And then uh, when you go underwater, you realize, oh, there's nowhere for this coral to attach. This is all sand. The model was wrong. Or, ooh, it's way too still here. And this coral needs to have lots of wave energy or whatever. So, yeah, there's a fair bit of uh, care that needs to go in before you plant them, but on the positive side, you might have seen the research from, I think it was South Florida, where uh, a coral reef ecologist there accidentally discovered that if he broke his branching coral into lots of tiny pieces, the regrowth rate was way faster. So that means uh, in the nursery, the coral nursery, you can grow up lots of these corals much quicker than they thought they could. So the main bottleneck is finding, uh, identifying the right locations to put them uh, and getting them there quickly because, you know, it's expensive. you got to go there in a boat. And the difference, too, uh, it's a lot different when you're thinking about, let's say, Florida, which doesn't have that many reefs. So it's much less of a logistical challenge than something like the 3,000 plus reefs of the Great Barrier Reef, which stretch over 2,000 kilometers um, within an area of over 340,000 square kilometers. So it's tricky to pick the right spot. Uh, is the Ningaloo Reef suffering from bleaching as bad as the Great Barrier Reef? Ah, good question. So uh, it's interesting. Um, we haven't had the same level of events at Ningaloo that we've had on the GBR. Different 
um, global weather patterns um, are affecting Ningaloo than what affect the Great Barrier Reef. Um, so we've been lucky that uh, the frequency of bleaching at Ningaloo hasn't yet reached that crisis level of happening so close together as what happened on the GBR. Um, but it's only a matter of time. Um, I was part of a paper about coral disease, uh, which was published a few years ago. And one of the things that we tried to simulate was how many years will it take before we have coral bleaching every single year? And we calculated that separately uh, for uh, the entire world's coral reefs at a pixel size or a square of, uh, I think it was 50 kilometers. Um, and so the Great Barrier Reef wasn't supposed to start bleaching every year, like two years in a row for much longer than uh, was implied by those events that we just had. But yes, it's really spatially variable. Um, and that makes it confusing to people, I think, because um, it's not like the entire Great Barrier Reef is dead. Um, some places are thriving and healthy because it's it always uh, is very patchy. Um, and yes, some reefs like Ningaloo haven't really copped it yet to the same level as other places. Um, and it's just because it it matters what's going on at a very fine local scale, you know, uh, tens of meters around a reef um, embedded within the broader oceanographic patterns. Um, with that, how much is bleaching linked to El Nino, La Nina, Southern Oscillation um, events? and the, the effects that they have on the warm ocean currents in the East Australian currents and the Lewin current, like with the La Nina year this year, is it more expected that we might have bleaching on the Ningaloo after a year like this? Or um, is it directly, is that what the main variability is linked to? Or is it more of a uh, average climate scale thing? Uh, okay, yeah, I mean, the the, Background warming has an impact on the condition of the coral, which is another thing we talked about in that paper. So um, if it never, if the typical temperatures on reefs are higher than before, that increases the incidence of disease and it makes the corals less robust. But generally you're talking about, um, yes, those big, oceanographic systems like El Nino, La Nina, um, where you're going to, in a particular area, get a concentration of overheated water. And then when you combine that with the likelihood of still conditions, uh, so the winds drop off, plus you've got a blob of, of warmer than normal water, that's when you've got those conditions that are just right uh, for bleaching. Uh, and then the other dimension to it uh, is uh, the storminess. So for example, on the East Coast, when you have La Nina, uh, you tend to have uh, cyclone activity move closer to the coast and more likely, you're more likely to have storms impacting the Great Barrier Reef. So if you were, if you did have overheated water, but you have lots of storminess, then those uh, waves from the cyclones actually can, uh, if the water is sufficiently deep, they can actually uh, perturb or overturn the water column sufficiently to drag up cold water from the deep uh, and cool the reefs off. Uh, and so that's one of the things that I study. They're called cool wakes. So that's a complicating factor. And then you've got the vulnerability or the susceptibility of the actual colonies at the fine scale. Um, and uh, local scale um, hydrodynamics, which might mean that, oh, in this particular area, there's a water circulation that tends to, um, to keep things from ever getting too still and too hot. 
And therefore, even though the broader context is that, that we've got overheated water at that particular spot, it doesn't happen because of that, that uh, regional um, circulation. Um, and then, so there's that. And then um, you also have that the different types of corals vary in their susceptibility as well. So you've got things happening at different scales. Um, but at that broader scale, yes, you're totally right. It's those big weather patterns that are driving what's happened. Um, but they're superimposed on water that's generally warmer. Um, and in the 2016, 17 event, maybe it was the 2017 one, there were actually corals uh, in the northern Great Barrier Reef where the, the magnitude of the temperature rise was so high that there was no way those corals could recover. They didn't even bother to spit out their zooxanthellae because they just basically cooked in place. Um, so there's the duration and the magnitude of these hot water events that are both important. Um, so yeah, we don't, we really don't want uh, those super, super hot events to happen because then it's just mortality all the way. Okay, thank you so much, Dr. Mari. Um, that was very um, eye-opening. I think we saved the best till last this year with um, that presentation. So thank you so much. Um, as the last uh, Zoom into schools for this year, I just want to take this opportunity to thank all the scientists um, across the research institutions in Western Australia that contributed this year. Um, not just these um, students here from Sacred Heart, but um, who want to have a wave. Sarah. <laughs> Big thank you from us um, and, uh, and a, a massive thank you to West Australian Marine Science Institute and Alida Johnson, who is about to um, move on to different pastures. Um, so she's at the back there. Thank you very much, Alida, on behalf of all the um, marine schools in Western Australia. Um, it's been another fantastic year and we really hope it continues on in the future and it couldn't happen without um, people like you, Dr. Mari, to uh, contribute and, and give their time for the next generation of young marine scientists. No problem at all. Very um, honoured to be part of it um, and excited to see what amazing things these young people do to help save our reefs and our planet.